with Giorgio Rucaleri, who is assistant professor at University of Lorraine. So it's in uh, France. Uh, ben Mosley in CMU, you know where every, that is, everybody. Kim Tang, who is my host. I'm a postdoc at Every, and he's my host. He's also in, uh, it's in France, and Denis Tristam. So we have been looking uh, for non-preemptive non scheduling for a long time, almost. And this is one of the latest results uh, that we have come up with in a series of that work that we have been doing. So I start with the uh, problem definition, which is pretty straightforward and very simple. So you have um, M uh, related machines. Related machines means that you have speed for each machine. So machine I here has speed SI. So the faster the speed, uh, the faster you execute the job or reprocess the job. And you have sets of jobs. So the job has different characteristics. So one is the processing requirement. It's denoted by PJ. That means it takes that amount of time to execute on a machine where the speed is unit. If it is, uh, the speed is twice, it says PJ over 2. Uh, you have a release date, which means that job arrives at RJ. That means job is ex ready for execution only after RJ. So before RJ, it's not available for execution. And you have weights, which is, gives the job important weight. So the higher the weight, the higher the job is important for you. And the goal here is to design a non-preemptive schedule. So the non-preemptive schedule would mean that you start at a particular time and execute the job until its uh, completion. You can't you know, stop in between, do context switch, and then come back to it or resume it. It's not allowed. And the objective is you're trying to minimize the maximum weighted flow time. So uh, the maximum weighted flow time is basically uh, the response time, how long the job remains in the system. So assume that you have designed some kind of algorithm which schedules the job at some point, And its completion time, when the execution co completes, the CJ, so CJ minus RJ is basically the quantity the job remains in your system. It, so this includes two things. It has waiting time and it has processing time. And you're trying to minimize the maximum. So it's L infinity norm, that's all. So there's a one con L1 norm that we have done before uh, and on general LP norm and then specifically on this uh, L infinity norm because we can improve the results from using some techniques from previous works. OK, so this is the problem. So what's the model that we are looking into? So one is that job arrives online. So you don't know about the job's characteristics before it arrives. So what is the RJ? What is the processing time? And what is its weight? Nothing. So you know when it arrives only. And we're looking at worst case, basically. And when the job arrives, you know its processing time and its weight. So this is called in scheduling as uh, clairvoyant. So there's a non-clairvoyant model where you don't know the processing time. So you execute the job until it gets complete. And then you know what the processing time was. But here we assume that we know the processing time. So uh, what we are going to look is something called as competitive ratio, just to in case everybody is not from online algorithms. So here the objective value that you're trying to minimize is with respect to the offline optimal. So the offline optimal actually knows the instance beforehand. It knows what jobs are going to arrive, when it is going to arrive. It, it has all those properties beforehand, and it decides the schedule, whereas you are trying to do online scheduling. So you don't know anything about future. So there's a huge, uh, you can say, uh, lag between what optimal will look like. It has a lot of more power in some sense compared to you. OK, so given this, we are trying to find uh, this ratio and trying to minimize it. So what is known is that if your weights are equal or 1, that is basically unweighted case, in that you can have simple uh, first come, first serve, and you can get a 3 approximation, uh, a 3 competitive ratio. Okay. Uh, then there was a result uh, which gives 13.5, which was later improved to 12.5 on a related set of machines. So identical set of machine, it takes PJ amount of time on each machine. It takes PJ on machine with, so all the machines have same speed basically. It's just a parallel set of machines that you're trying to execute. So as I remember, this algorithm is basically for a preemptive algorithm. So it's not non-preemptive. And when you have weights, it has been shown that there is a strong lower bound. So the question is uh, what to do now. Uh, it has also been shown that a lot of work that people do in, uh, you know, practical that they have shown there are a lot of heuristics which work good. So there should be somewhere that you should be able to say that certain algorithms are good and certain algorithms are bad. So in this domain, uh, something is used as a resource augmentation, which is very common. So resource augmentation is that uh, algorithms are allowed to use a little bit of extra resources. And uh, so you can think about you are having, so the first one is you have having a higher speed. So basically, uh, you can think about in each time unit, you're trying to execute 1 plus epsilon. So it was, let's say speed was 1. Then in one time unit, you execute one time unit of a job. 
but with higher speed you will execute one plus epsilon unit of a job. So, just epsilon higher and uh, there is also similarly more number of machines. So, maybe optimal algorithm has m machines and you have m times one plus epsilon. So, slightly higher number of machines and it is very old work, but I, I, I cannot tell you number of papers that have come up on this area at least hundred papers on this, this alone how much you can use this kind of model to actually give uh, different algorithms and show that they are good in this certain models. And uh, in 2015, Chaudhary et al, they proposed a model. So, in this model they said that you can actually reject certain number of jobs. So, instead, instead of uh, executing all the jobs, let us say in instance i, you take i into 1 minus epsilon. So, you do not execute or do not compute your object value on the epsilon fact of the jobs, but the rest of them you compute. So, it is a kind of resource augmentation where you can think that you have certain number of more machines which can you know take these epsilon jobs and run them separately without worrying about the objective going very bad. And in this sense now the competitive ratios definition is redefined. So, now you have algorithm solution using resource augmentation whereas, the optimal is not using resource augmentation. So, when we talk about rejection mostly think about uh, you are rejecting jobs, but your algorithm has to execute all the jobs. So, basically now even though it knows entire instance beforehand, you have kind of taken certain you know uh, power from it in certain sense. Or you have given more power to your algorithm, some of your fairness. I said this is a lot of work has been done. So, some of the work which is currently which is particularly related to the problem that I am talking about is is uh, in it is known in speed augmentation model. So, the first one is talks about actually weighted problem and it shows that ok, if you get epsilon c you can get a constant uh, competitive ratio. And similarly, so there are multiple results, but all of them I as I remember these are all uh, in the settings where either you have weights equals to 1 or they are preemptive in nature. And the rejection paper that came itself proposed the uh, a competitive ratio, but they have done it on a preemptive problem not on a non preemptive problem. So, non preemptive problem are much harder than preemptive. So, what do we show is that you can get a constant competitive ratio if you reject epsilon fractions of job. So, basically this theorem says it is not exactly the statement of theorem, but it says that you can get a constant approximation a constant competitive ratio if you do not ex execute epsilon fractions of job. So, uh, first I will try to talk about what the how the idea comes up what is the intuition behind it and then try to give you know something about algorithm, but not the entire proof. So, no nowhere you will find a lot of maths at least from my perspective it is not a lot of maths. So, assume all weights are 1 very simple problem and you have a single machine not multiple machines ok. Uh, so, what you know is that the maximum processing time is w uh, f sorry. So, you are assuming that ok uh, f is the maximum is what is the optimal looks like the optimal quantity that you are trying to optimize. So, what you can do is you can take a very large interval a very huge interval and think about all the jobs which are which are released during this interval. So, what happens there are a lot number of jobs because there are a lot number of uh, so the interval is quite huge and you are trying to pack all the jobs within this interval. So, all the jobs which are released in this interval you pack them there itself you really do not care about the jobs which is uh, released here on here. And the idea is that you have since you have lot number of jobs maybe you can reject one of the jobs of certain number of jobs and fit all the jobs within that interval. So, if you can do the if you can do that then you can take each interval separately and schedule it independently kind of thing ok. So, the argument is that if there is no space to schedule that means there are at least 1 over epsilon jobs because the maximum processing time is f. So, you can just figure it out from there. So, huge number of jobs you have you can reject this job it is not really you are rejecting very small fraction ok. But the assumption is that here is that if the job is released here you schedule it in this interval if a job is released let us say at this point red job then also you schedule it before the time. So, this is not exactly trying to follow the release dates. So, how did you do that so, it is pretty straightforward you can you make an offline schedule where you try to fit every job that is released in this interval in during this interval and then schedule it in the next interval. So, something along this line you are actually delaying it only 2 times. So, first you collect the job in one interval and then you schedule it in the next interval so, that is the basic idea behind it. So, now this is on a single machine this is with just a single weight. So, the point is how do we go from mul uh, to the multiple weights and multiple machines what do we do is. So, this is just an idea we classify jobs into multiple classes according to weights. So, we take ok the weights are basically from 1 to k something around this line and then deal separately with each class. We are going to reject uh, in each class some 
jobs to create the space. And then we're going to start uh, designing an offline schedule, which is basically from max weight to min weight. So first we give priority to scheduling higher weight of jobs because their objective value is higher. They have high weights. And then you use offline this assignment to figure out in online where to exactly schedule the job. And then again, we'll do some more rejections uh, because there will be overlap because of different ways. There will be overlap intervals to compensate. You have to reject again a certain number of jobs. And then you're going to schedule the remaining jobs non preemptively. So, okay, I'll detail out at least some part of it, not the proof. So, again, the objective that you're trying to minimize is max this quantity. You have sets of machine. So, what you do is you index your machine into uh, according to their speed. So, S1 has the highest speed, where SM has the lowest speed here. Assume that S is optimal. So understand that the problem is online. So even if you assume f is optimal, it's not sure that you can derive an algorithm which can actually schedule it because you don't know the future jobs. So the only assumption is that you know optimal, and at some point, uh, if you know, if we will figure out how to remove that uh, knowledge on f anyway. So assume that you know the objective uh, value f. Can you design a schedule? Now the problem becomes like this. So what we say that okay, j is valid on some machine uh, where its objective is less than f. What this means exactly if we pick the J and schedule on that machine, can that j machine be can that job be scheduled on that particular machine or not? So if, if you look at the valid set of machines for a particular job, then optimal will also schedule the job on one of these machines. And uh, so now what we do, as I said, we are going to use rounding. So we round the weights of each job to the form of one over epsilon to the k. So we round down the jobs basically. Okay. So b J belongs to class k if its weight is between uh, one over epsilon to the k to 1 over epsilon to the k plus 1. So this will lose uh, a factor of 1 over epsilon in the final, final result, but it's okay. So now what you do is, in a single machine case, for when we have weights for 1, we were trying to create intervals. So now we are trying to create intervals for different weight classes. So assume that you have a weight class this. So basically, uh, the job will have a weight 1 over epsilon to the k. And for this, you, different, you have different uh, intervals. So the idea would be, that if a job is released in this interval, if it's scheduled, it will be scheduled somehow using some algorithm in that interval. Similarly, for this particular weight, which is smaller, and so on and so forth. What is also uh, interesting is that these weight classes are nested. So, in this particular example, uh, you can see that the interval size is f to the epsilon to the k over epsilon cube. So, okay, you can think about this epsilon cube as epsilon to the c, any large value. The cube is there just because it fits in our example, but you can think about large, huge uh, size of an interval. So what does it say if you look at it? So the maximum processing time of a job is basically f times epsilon to the k. This is the optimal quantity. It's w times pj. So w is 1 over epsilon to the k. So pj is going to be at most this quantity. This means if you, if you have an interval of that size, there are going to be at least 1 over epsilon to the q jobs which can be scheduled in that interval particularly. Okay, and then we say that J belongs to certain type KL uh, when J is of type class K. So it's basically based on weight and it is released in this interval. So exactly if a job is released in this interval, we say that it belongs to this class K which is basically uh, depends on its weight and at what time it is released. So again, so what we do is we reject, as I said, so we're going to reject small fractions of jobs and we execute everybody else. So the idea is that assume that JKL here denotes all the sets of jobs that are of type KL, okay? And again, uh, what does it mean of being a type KL? That means WJ is in this form and its release time is somewhere in this interval. Take all these jobs, sort them in the uh, descending order of the processing time. Once you have that, you reject first epsilon square fractions of job, okay? So the argument is that since you're rejecting epsilon square heaviest, largest volume jobs, you are having, you are rejecting at least epsilon square by volume. So you are creating that much of space. And since the weights are rounded, you are rejecting at most other epsilon total weights of jobs. So weights are rounded down, so you might have more rejections of, because of you are rejecting higher weights maybe. But still it's okay because we are rejecting order epsilon. Now, it might be that you don't have that many of jobs to reject in the first place. And uh, this part is basically to ensure that actually you are rejecting something. Otherwise, you can have at every level 1 over epsilon minus 1 jobs, and you never reject any job. So to ensure that you are actually rejecting some jobs, and you are creating space, which we need to, uh, in the argument, you make sure that if you happen to have, you know, one level higher, you reject one job 
for every one over epsilon jobs and uh, for every job that is you know two levels higher you reject at least one job because when you take the weights this is uh, one over eps order epsilon weight rejection and this is again order epsilon weight rejection even less than that. So it might look like that uh, for the same job we are rejecting at multiple level many jobs but since they are rounded when you sum it up it is become a geometric and it is at most two times the epsilon. So what we can show is that you know your algorithm rejects at most order epsilon fraction of total volume of job. So we have created for an interval epsilon square volume of uh, rejection. So we have shown okay that you have rejected epsilon square of jobs for each interval somehow. And the argument the, I am not sure to prove but proof is based on so you can make a KRA tree talk about rejected jobs and the leaves and you try to associate the rejected jobs with the leaf and then argue that if if you have that many of rejections at leaf itself then you can talk about higher levels because every time you go higher level you will reject that jobs anyway so it is okay. So the proof is technical but it is uh, almost pretty straightforward okay. So when we have done rejection uh, we have to schedule the jobs so now we have set of non uh, non rejected jobs and we have to schedule them the schedule is simple you take the J non rejected job find out the sets of machine where it is be scheduled you already have this set with you and you start from the slowest machine and you go to the fastest machine. So you first try to fix on the slowest machine and if you cannot your second slowest third slowest and you know to the fastest machine. So basically this again the same thing is like you schedule each non rejected job on machines where you have these free slots. So this will create a preemptive schedule but we really do not care because this is an offline schedule when we will convert to the real schedule that is where we need to be a non preemptive. So here just the volume argument is enough. So what can we show is that okay this will opt uh, this will output a preemptive schedule that ensures that if a job is released in IKL it is scheduled in IKL within the IKL and the uh, the proof is basically a volume volume argument we have shown that we have rejected epsilon square of jobs if you are not able to schedule a job that means the whole interval is busy. So basically you have these many volumes of job but optimal has at most this much of jobs. So this is the counter argument that you are somehow this does not fit into your thing then you can show that okay J has enough space anyway. So now the question is uh, how to convert it to offline to online. So there is a problem because of different weights. So figure out that okay in so assume that in offline case the job was actually scheduled here but in online case you will schedule the job after this interval when the interval actually ends. Similarly a, a job when you have computed the offline case you have computed using all these jobs but when you are actually scheduling you are actually scheduling it later. So there are jobs which do not fit together because there are certain jobs which are released here and they might be scheduled here. This is not how you decided to schedule the jobs prior. So fitting might be a problem but you can do the same trick here think about taking a large number of intervals itself and then delete one of the one of the complete intervals epsilon fractions of job within that interval to create a space. So I am not going to detail because it is the same thing that we have shown before it is just uh, same volume argument will go there also you just reject more jobs that is all. As I said so it is basically uh, delays the job by this quantity. So now you can you can take 1 over epsilon or 1 over epsilon q whatever number of intervals and delete all the jobs in one of these intervals that are released. So you have enough space to schedule rest of the jobs and you can show that all non rejected job are scheduled in basically uh, for class k is scheduled basically in this size of interval I think it is 2 c should be ok. So now uh, the question is that when we are actually trying to schedule the job our algorithm is you always pick the job with the highest weight class and you schedule it and then you go to the lower weight classes. It might be that these algorithms are non preemptive because you are scheduling a job and uh, which is of lower weight at particular point time interval and there is a higher weight job available. So in that case you can just reject the job. So what do you mean by that if a job is running a large job is running. So let us say that job J is running on some machine I and 1 over epsilon jobs arrive of class K or K, K plus 1 or K. So you can reject the job K. Yeah you can reject uh, it should be 1 over epsilon square basically but ok you can reject the job J because you are rejecting one job over 1 over epsilon again so it is epsilon factor it is just a fitting argument and what you show that for rest of the jobs you can schedule it in uh, f over 2 to the epsilon to the c c is some constant which is 3 I think in our algorithm okay. so now it becomes the whole algorithm becomes non preemptive another question is that we assume that we know the f 
So there's, there's a standard technique in online algorithms when you're trying to remove the knowledge on f is use the doubling trick. So start with the trivial assumption that f equals to 1. And every time you're not, you have to reject more than epsilon jobs, the proof has shown that it's, if your assumption was right, you should have scheduled that many of jobs. So assumption was not there, you double it up. That means the optimal is also doubling up in some certain case. It's not, uh, yeah, it is at most uh, two factor away from you. And finally, we can show that with all these tricks that you can get uh, some constant factor approximation where f is the optimal solution. So you get 1 over epsilon to the 9. So yeah, so the concluding remarks, we've shown powers of rejection in a certain sense that uh, prior to all these works, rejections were pretty focused on trying to, you know, handle cases where you have preemptions, but we've shown, okay, for non-preemptive, you can get better, some good results, at least interesting. It has a scalability in the sense that, uh, it's not exactly what you mean, but okay, scalability means you can reject more jobs and get closer to the optimal in certain sense. Think like something like betas, you can have more time to run. So there are two open problems. So one is that um, we don't make immediate decisions. We let the job run and then we reject at certain point the job. The question is, can we make certain immediate decisions? And the second is, can we solve the problem on unrelated machines? So this work was actually, we were trying to solve this problem, which we were not able to solve, so instead we solved this. So this problem is much harder, I think, because uh, even in the preemptive setting, there is no result, which we often re leverage to talk about in non-preemption also. So can you minimize unrelated machines? Unrelated machine basically means that for each machine, you have different processing time. So when the job arrives, you get a vector. And uh, the PIJ, it becomes, instead of PJ, it becomes PIJ. So for each machine, you have different processing time. And they are unrelated. So maybe one job is faster on one machine, another job may be slower on that machine. So there's no relation whatsoever. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. So what is your result when you consider the L1 norm? Like here, you're considering L infinity norm, right? So yeah, L1 norm, uh, you have 1 over epsilon to the cube. So you reject epsilon fractions of jaw, and you can get 1 over epsilon to the cube. Yeah, so no one's going to take you. You can tighten all these things, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>